you don't really want to mob, you don't want to know your eyes when it comes to the best. You ain't never tried, you ain't never tried, you ain't never ride or survive over time with the best. I've been doing this show my whole life, I've been doing this show my whole life, I've been doing this show my whole life. I want to know your eyes when it comes to the best. Doing this 
show my whole life. I've been doing this show my whole life. I wanna know your eyes when it comes to the best.
wanna know your eyes when it comes to the When you did improv, who'd you do improv with? Hmm. Okay, so you fancy yourself a journalist. Would you say you're friends with Scott Colton? So you're not friends with him? Oh, wow. Well, that makes two of us. My point is, if you fancy yourself a journalist, even if it's for the silly world of professional wrestling, and you have journalistic integrity, people who report things mostly that are bullshit and slanderous lies against myself. If you are friends with somebody, you blew my spot. If you're not friends with them, I apologize. But you should probably disclose who you're friends with. Um, I haven't had anything to do with Scott Colton in almost a decade. Probably wanted nothing to do with him even longer than that. It's fucking unfortunate that I have to come up here and speak on this when I'm on my time and this is a fucking business. Uh, why I'm a grown ass adult man and I decide not to be friends with somebody is nobody else's fucking business. But my friends, if I fall backwards, will catch me. Scott Colton, I felt never would have. My problem was I wanted to bring a guy with me to the top that did not want to see me at the top. Okay. You call it jealousy, you call it envy, whatever the fuck it is. My relationship with Scott Colton ended long before I paid all of his bills. I have every receipt, I have every invoice, I have every email. I have the email where he says, and I quote, I agree to go our separate ways. I will get my own lawyer and you do not have to pay anymore. That's an email that I have. The only reason the public did not see is because when I finally had to counter sue him through discovery, we discovered he shared a bank account with his mother. That's a fact. And as soon as we discovered that fact and we subpoenaed old Marsha, he sent the email, oh, can we please drop all this? Now, it's 2022. I haven't been friends with this guy since at least 2014, late 2013. And the fact that I have to sit up here because we have irresponsible people who call themselves EVPs and couldn't fucking manage a target and they spread lies and bullshit and, and put into a media that I got somebody fired when I have fuck all to do with him. Want nothing to do with him. Do not care where he works, where he doesn't work, where he eats, where he sleeps. And the fact that I have to get up here and do this in 2022 is fucking embarrassing. And if y'all are at fault, fuck you. If you're not, I apologize. But what did I ever do in this world to go to deserve an empty headed fucking dumb fuck like hangman Adam page to go out on national television and fucking go into business for himself 
For what? What did I do? Dave, what did I ever do? Didn't do a goddamn thing. What's your name, sir? Fuck the Pittsburgh Penguins. What are you doing, man? What are you doing? I made it really clear in Forbes, and I just want to make it clear again. Nick, It's when- not his position to make it very fucking clear. There's people who call themselves EVPs that should have fucking known better. This shit was none of their business. I understand sticking up for your fucking friends. I fucking get it. I stuck up for that guy more than anybody. Okay? I paid his bills until I didn't, and it was my decision not to. Yeah, but I shouldn't have no commented when Nick first said it. It's my I, fault. And I if I hadn't, it's my that. fault. It's my I appreciate fault. That, I should have just I'm, taken it head on because you never said anything. But I'm trying to run a fucking business. And when somebody who hasn't done a damn thing in this business jeopardizes the first million-dollar house that this company has ever drawn off of my back and goes on national television and does that, it's a disgrace to this industry. It's a disgrace to this company. Now, we're far beyond apologies. Right, I gave him a fucking chance. It did not get handled, and you saw what I had to do, which is very regrettable, lowering myself to his fucking level. But that's where we're at right now. And I will still walk up and down this hallway and say, if you have a fucking problem with me, take it up with me. Let's fucking go. What's your question, Nick? Uh, Why now? What, what, why, why is MJF back in the fold now? How do you both feel about him being around? How do you feel about the time he spent away? All of that. Well, if I may, I am the one who asked him to come back because uh, MJF is a big star in this company, and this is a, one of the biggest events. A year ago, CM Punk debuted here, and I thought it was right for the fans. And like I said, for the fans, I thought the best thing that we could do as a company was bring MJF back. Because he wants me to work with pricks constantly. That's that's what it is. Nevertheless, uh, it, Two of the top wrestlers in the world, MJF and CM Punk. Could be oh, a big match down the line. Sorry to keep bringing this fucking up, but I've never spoken his word, and I don't know how long, so I'm a little fucking pissed off about it. When it came down that he was going to sue me, I asked to talk to him. He refused. I asked for mediation. It was denied. I offered him money. He said it was not enough. He went ahead with the lawsuit and sued. It's his fucking funeral. I don't care. He shares a bank account with his mother. It tells you all you need to know about what kind of character that is. I appreciate it, Nick. I'm sorry if I'm a little fucking snippy. I'm hurt and I'm old and I'm fucking tired and I work with fucking children. I regret not answering your question the first time you asked it. Yeah, but I should have just taken a head on like I did with Blake and Forbes recently. We're all learning here, Tony. It's okay. Thanks. Thanks. This is from Mindy's Bakery, by the way. It's a great place in Chicago. If you like pastries and baked goods, I suggest you go there. They're closed on Mondays and Tuesdays, though. Uh, Sorry Sorry about all that, Mandy. All right, thanks. So I've asked questions of presidential candidates in my old life. I don't think I've ever been as nervous (laughs) as I am right now, but I'll I'll direct this one to Tony. Um, You saw the reaction MJF got when he came back out at the end of the night. Do you have any worries that um, you know, he was cheered in Chicago while CM Punk, hometown guys, and do you have any worries about um, MJF kind of, he got pure booze before. He was a, one of the last pure heels left in wrestling that didn't try to get cheered. And now he's sort of set up as this anti-authority figure. Do you, do you worry about what that means for the psychology going forward, especially if he's going to take on Punk? I think the fans want to see great wrestling matches. MJF's the top wrestler. CM Punk's the world champion, the top wrestler in the world. And I think having the top contenders, whoever came out of this match tonight, MJF sets up as a great challenger. And now CM Punk uh, is the world champion. MJF being back. A lot of fans were excited to see it, but anytime somebody makes a comeback in the world of wrestling, generally you get a really big reaction. Am I worried about it? No, not really. Like we have one of the most charismatic, popular professional wrestlers in the world right here. And frankly, the fans can react however they want. That's what's great about AEW and pro wrestling. We're not trying to tell people what to think. This is a really compelling story. People were emotionally moved. People are calling that a great ending. And I'm really glad people liked it. But the fact is it was a great match and it was a great ending. And Now we'll see what happens on Wednesday. I'm not going to comment on that. I'll tell you why I'm upset about it is because if you're an EVP, you don't try to middle your top baby face. 
try to get your niche audience that's on the internet to hate him for some made up bullshit rumor. Really pisses me off. Stepping on your own dick, trying to fucking, you know, make money, sell tickets, fill arenas. And these stupid guys think they're in Reseda. Yep. Dominic D'Angelo, adfreeshows.com. Uh, Punk, last time we were here last year, I asked you about like Terry Funk and his influence, like yeah. the legacy going on. Kind of, uh, and this is for you too, Tony. I kind of like, there, there, you did, you've done a great job with incorporating legends throughout you know, the course of AEW and as it goes on. I kind of want to see uh, what you feel about how a lot of the modern talent today can kind of utilize some of the advice and take advice from like guys like William Regal and uh, even like Jim Ross, Tony Schiavone. Um, I know I'm missing Jake Roberts, plenty I'm missing, I'm sure. But I just kind of want to get both your perspectives on that and how that can kind of go a little bit more to, to help you guys out grow as a company we have a uh, a locker room full of pretty brilliant minds you know jerry lynn Dean malenko mark henry you know i when i came back and i cut my promo my second week here i thought it was i thought it was pretty decent you know what i mean kind of blur the lines a little bit what's he doing how crazy phil he's going into business for himself and really i was just defending myself but you know you you, you mix that in with attacking moxley and mention um you know kingston being the second best kingston which is pretty great line um you know uh but our locker room for all the wisdom and brilliance it has isn't worth shit when you have an empty-headed idiot who's never done anything in the business do public interviews and say i don't really take advice who the fuck do you think you are you know that's stupid i'm on a team with barry bonds mark mcguire sammy sosa and I, I don't need I don't need to work on my swing. You don't. Yeah, I'm not going to listen to these guys. They're going to tell me how to swing a baseball. Fucking go fuck yourself. That's how I feel about it. I, I, I dare you to fucking say that this Terry Funk's face. I don't need to listen to you, Mister Funk. I know what I'm doing. Fucking grow up. Uh, question for uh, Punk. Um, Phil I'm Lindsay sorry. From Bleach Report. What? So we can't hear you. Sorry. Um, question for CM Punk. Uh, Phil Lindsay from Bleach Report. Um, I think it caught a lot of people by surprise, your loss two weeks ago and the, your foot injury came into play. And I wonder, you know, how much of that came into play tonight? Because a lot of fans would assume that that was part of the reason you lost, but that didn't seem to hamper you tonight. Um, I'm wearing Dan Housen's boots. This is a true story. So I, I assume that it's like some sort of a reverse curse. I've had a real problem with footwear. I've been trying to figure out like what to wear. And that's real life. Like I put my old wrestling shoes on and they didn't fit. I bought a new pair of 12s. They didn't fit. Um, I've thought about wearing my gym shoes. They didn't have the stability I needed. And uh, I bought a pair of Doc Martens because they're really comfortable. But they're too loose. And then Dan House was like, you want to try mine on? I'm like, they're a size 10. And I put them on and they just magically fit. It, it, it like, like unbelievable, like a glove. They're tight, but not too tight. They give me stability and they're comfortable as hell. So I owe him more money now. <laughs> Hi, Tony. Hi, Punk. Um, Izzy, Izzy how are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm sorry if I'm <laughs> scary. No, it's okay. No, I like you, though. You're right. Thank you. I, I like you, too. I'm a Thank huge you. fan. <laughs> um, Izzy from the Hot Tag with Izzy. This question is actually directed towards Punk. Uh, we saw, you know, you got your huge win tonight. Congratulations. And then also MJF returned. What is the message that you're trying to direct towards MJF this time around? Because you did have a feud with him a couple months ago. I, I mean, do I have to? I, I, I guess... Uh, I don't know. I'm tired of wrestling these pricks. <laughs> I'm tired of wrestling these kids that think they uh, they know everything, um, you know. But um, I'm not. I'm not the boss. I uh, he won the number number one contendership, and uh, I guess I'll cross that bridge when I get to it. Um, I, I think Max is uh, a, a supremely talented individual, um, but this goes for him and anybody else in the locker room that doesn't want to be here you know the grass is not greener on the other side the grass is greener where you water it and max likes to uh you know shit where he eats instead of watering the grass so you know we'll have to we'll have to see how that goes thanks izzy uh, john alba podcast heat uh, punk a year ago we were in this room and it was after adam cole had debuted brian danielson had debuted 
and you said that it, it had the feeling of bash at the beach oh boy. where where there was did that i say energy. that it was that energy. did i say that and uh, uh a year later here you are world champion uh, through the trials and tribulations what's your honest assessment of the last year for you personally and professionally um like i i know it sounds like again it sounds like a pretty ridiculous statement you know but i would like to think and again in five years you know you'll 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 see the impact of it um there's a chance I'm wrong. You know, we got an uphill battle in a, in a, in a lot of respects. Um, there's just so much drama and turmoil going on, but I, you know, I, I like to believe in the place I work. Um, we do have a very, very strong roster. And like I said, we have, we have a lot of brilliant minds backstage. So if, uh, if, if young talent's willing to actually listen and, and receive uh, advice and information, I honestly think sky's the limit. You know, there's always going to be people who, think they should be the top guy want to be pushed you know um and i get that i mean that was that was me from like 2008 to you know 2010 or whatever and you know i i i, I always wanted more um but I, I i thought i acted like a top guy you know like if i missed a flight i rented a car and made the town i didn't just go oh, i missed the flight i guess i'm not going to be a tv um I think Adam Cole is 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 fantastic. I'm 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 more worried about his health now than worry about if if his impact on wrestling is going to be you know bigger than Scott Hall's or something like that. Like I I just want the kid to be healthy because he's a he's a, he's a sweetheart. You know, um, I know Eric Bischoff is really mad that I said that, so I stand by it. Uh, um, can you tell me a little bit about the recovery from the foot injury? As far as you know, I know you went through. It's three months. That was Awful. pretty quick. That's, you know, and you had sur you had major surgery, you know, that stuff put in and everything. So, uh, the, so, so again, what I, what I said in uh promo, I think maybe last week was, was true. I, I did the stage dive when an idiot, I must've hit my foot on the top of the guardrail, but I didn't feel it. And you would think that shit would hurt, but when I, people caught me, they put me back down. I waited for FTR and I, I'm standing on my foot and I'm, it just didn't feel right, you know? But I thought again, maybe I just whacked it or something like that. And then I, I wrestled on it, blew a springboard, came off the top of like a double ax, like did all this shit. And what I eventually did is, yeah, I fractured my foot, but then I pulverized the bones. Pulverized is the word Dr. Uh, Dr. Jung used. Surgery was supposed to be an hour. It wound up being like four and a half. I got three plates and 16 screws in my foot and I essentially, I, I have a new foot now, you know, um, it is a hundred percent, but it is a new hundred percent. And I'm, you know, I, I, every day I, I rehab, but when I, when I started rehab, this is the worst injury I've ever had, you know, um, had surgery on my elbow, easy, easy peasy, you know, lower back. I could bite the next day. I could get a coffee. I could go for a six hour walk. You know what I mean? And just, I could do something. I was bedridden for two weeks and it was really, really hard for me because I, I really wanted to have this great summer and do good for Tony and sell tickets, draw money, help with ratings. And it all just came crashing down, but that's life. You know, I, I missed out on forbidden door in United center. I really wanted to wrestle there, you know, and I, and I have, I, I have pride in my work and I wanted to carry the title and, you know, carry through the summer and just help, grow the business so it was mentally devastating i was bedridden for at least two weeks uh i would be dead if it wasn't for my wife i would also be dead because of my wife if that third week i didn't get out of bed <laughs> uh love april to death I, I i wouldn't be here right now in a lot of ways if it wasn't for her um it may sound corny to some people not being able to walk my dog was like really challenging you know uh and then the the rehab, like I could tell you how hard and painful it was and grueling, but I, I just wouldn't be able to do it justice. I was doing two and a half hours of rehab. Plus once they told me I could bike, I was biking my life away. Then I would go to the gym later and lift weights. And I was just trying to bust my ass to hurry up and not necessarily hurry up to get back. I wanted to hurry up to get healthy because if I'm not healthy, I'm no good to anybody it was just it was really really tough I, I i just think it's you know i'm i'm a little older now and 
it was just, it was a pretty ridiculous. I, I think if I was 23, it would have been a hard injury. You know what I mean? Because I, I literally couldn't do anything. Try to get around on crutches up and down stairs. You know, I got to walk two feet to go to the bathroom. I got crutches. It, it was just, it was pretty bad it, and it was depressing. Uh, but thank you for asking. <laughs> Will Washington, uh, Fightful. What up, Will? How you doing, Punk? I'm okay. <laughs> I got a question for you. So oh, that's why I'm here, right? Um, so I guess a good way to round this out would be to point out the fact that uh, your win tonight brought to an end a fairly legendary run for John Moxley. He hasn't been defeated in AEW in over a year. And uh, even with the months right? out, um, he hadn't, uh, I believe it was, what, double or nothing last year was the last time he was pinned? Um, and it was in a tag match. Yeah. In a he's tag never, match. yeah, it was the first time he's ever taken a clean pin in an AEW match ever, I would say. I mean, where it was under pretty fair circumstances right. in over three years. Yeah. So it's a, that brings to an end a fairly legendary run for John Moxley. Can you talk about um, what it means to be the guy to put an end to that run for Moxley? Oh, man. People are probably really mad at me then, huh? <laughs> Alvarez, are you mad at me? <laughs> All right. I'm a little mad at you, but uh, yeah. Um, I think me and Mox are so similar, and obviously, uh, we got a lot in common. You know, like both had some misdiagnosed staph infections. <laughs> uh, I mean, that's a, it's a weird thing to have in common. You know what I mean? Uh, uh, but we came from the same place, and I think we felt a lot of the same things there you know kind of like there was a bridesmaid but never the bride i can only hope that he appreciates um being able to me doing that for him just as i appreciate him doing this for me you know because i think we're both guys that nobody ever really did it for us you know uh guys could have helped us out a little bit more passed the torch a little bit more and i think we're on we're on even we're on an even footing whereas before maybe you thought you know like i'm the bigger star like i'm here to try to elevate anybody everybody and i'm not saying that i have elevated john moxley i like to think maybe i did i think that's what all of our jobs are is to get you know if if one person's up here is it's it's up to them to reach back and and get everybody up to that level but yeah i i think i think john moxley um we have different philosophies about pro wrestling, but it's it's a beautiful thing because it's it's all pro wrestling, you know. And <sighs> done right, it's it's just magic. I, I I think he's a hell of a talent, and I, uh, I I I sure do appreciate him, you know. Thank you very much. Alvarez, I just saw the video, man, and you were so incredulous that I went into business for myself, and I was just like, man. <laughs> Some people were upset that you had done that, and other people said that you were defending yourself. Which is what you said that you were defending yourself. I, and the reason I've never defended myself is because when you do, it just sounds like you're being defensive. But I've eaten shit on this subject for a very, very long time, um, and it, I am I'm very sad today that I had to get up here and 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 say his name. He doesn't fucking deserve it, uh, and talk about it. But facts are facts, you know. Name two people that have made the most money off the name CM Punk. I don't think you're there yet. The first one's Vince McMahon. The second one's Scott Colton. I hope you all have a good night. Please be more responsible with the news you get from certain people. And uh, just remember we're human beings. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bro, Larry got one of the biggest pops of the night earlier. He got Lucy ran down the, the thing. It was fucking great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Fuck Sydney Crosby. <laughs> fuck fuck Malkin. Fuck right. You know what? You know what? Fuck Ron Francis. How about that? I'm still fucking pissed about fuck him. There you go. Their Graham got a hat trick in fucking game one. They still lose and get sweeped. Oh.
somebody box up these spins. And fucking Can I have one? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thanks, Phil. Yeah, please. Thank it's you. Not that weirdo, non-alcoholic shit. Yeah, but I like. Water. Well, I like both. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Phil. Contrary to popular belief, I'm a very nice guy. Thank you. He's a sweetheart. He's a sweetheart. I like to eat with him at Jeff Ruby's Steakhouse. Uh, hey, speaking of the World Tag Team Champions, from the World Champion to the World Tag Team Champions, congratulations. Thank you very much, the mogul. Thank you very much, Keith. Thank you. Very excited about this. Very excited about this. Here, a water? Here's a water for, uh, can we put these belts up here for the guys? We got Thank this. You very much, gentlemen. Yes, sir. On a performance tonight. Uh, just kind of talk about that atmosphere for a little bit, which was one of the most surreal things I've experienced where you're getting scissor me daddy chants and, and all that good stuff. And man, boy, did the uh, start off as a baby face, baby face exchange there, man, really kind of quickly turned on you guys a little bit. Just talk about how insane that atmosphere was tonight. I would say me personally, I don't really feel like it was a turn per se. I just think that when they say everybody loves the acclaim, it's a literal statement. And why not? They're fun. They're charismatic. They're awesome. They got a lot of heart. To me, that was just the kind of atmosphere I liked. Like, we almost felt like we needed to prove something. And I think in the grand scheme of things, we did just that. Incredible. Yeah, um, for me, it's like, I don't think we have to prove anything at all. I think we've done that already. I mean, we've been here like seven, six months and all that. Like, what more do we have to prove? We proved that in New Orleans against Starks and Hobbs. We proved that in Double or Nothing in Vegas. I proved that single-handedly on my triple threat matches in Vegas. And we did it again on uh, in Georgia. You know, what more do we have to keep doing to keep proving that we are the mountain of this tag team division and they have to come up any tag team really acclaimed, especially they found that out tonight, they got to come up and prove it to us that they deserve this, that they need to, you know, like, Hey, this isn't, this isn't fun and games. You know what I mean? I take this seriously. Keith takes this seriously. Sometimes I may take it more seriously than him, but I don't think this is a shock at all. It's a surprise. We, I'm a performer and a professional before I'm a baby face or anything that you want to call me. No, I'm going to go out there and I'll do what I do, regardless of the crowds behind me or not. I'm going to go out there, throw touchdown passes, whether they boo me or not, I'm still going to score. That's what I do. That's what Keith does. Um, first off, congratulations on your win. In my opinion, you two had the match of the night. Thank you. Uh, my name's AJ from the AJ Awesome Show. My question is, back in the Casino Battle Royale, it showed that you two had some problems between the two. How, uh, how have those problems affected you, and do you think they will come up in the future? I mean, uh, you want to take this first? I'll talk to the young man. Um, <laughs> no, like, like I said, I'm a very competitive person. I want to win in all aspects of this industry entertainment with putting the best song out, having the best rap verse on a, on a track with great artists and then getting to the ring with battle Royal. I have a very highly competitive nature about myself and it only grows the further I go, the higher up, the more than I do this, the more success I get, which I said that from day one, getting here in Orlando at revolution, you know, this, that's why you brought me out on that stage. Like the way you did, I am very competitive. I'm sorry. We didn't really have problems. We had like a little, little dip in the road and we fixed that. And you know what fixes everything? Winning. <laughs> uh, I would say this on a personal level. There, there is a slight difference in our mentality when it comes to the ring. Swerve obviously is a very competitive person. I very much am, but for me to reach a specific level and no one here has seen it yet. It's going to take a special someone to pull it out of me, to be worthy enough to pull out the other side of Keith Lee. I enjoy the fun in competition. I enjoy battles that make people feel what they felt tonight. That's what gets my blood pumping. And that's just something that makes me 
really go and, and, and fire up in this in this whole atmosphere. That atmosphere was something very different for me. I've never heard a crowd be so against me, and it just made me want to beat them up more. It was very different. But in the grand scheme of things, they impressed me. And I'm happy to be the one to bring that out of them. Like, <laughs> hey, I'm going to rip your gear apart. I'm sorry. I'll pay for the gear later out of my own pocket, but I'm going to do what I have to do. I'm a, I can get violent and really, really, really ravenous in that ring when I have to. And if I have to push the envelope like that to bring Keith Lee to that level, to push the envelope on him to defend these tag titles because so many people were against us having them in the first place. So we got to prove a lot of people wrong. I'm always like that. I'm super King Petty when it comes to that kind of stuff. Cause I read all y'all. I read everybody in here. I literally I listened to all your podcasts and I heard what y'all tell you about. <laughs> Cause the first thing that y'all said when we won the tag titles, no congratulations. No. Oh man. It's finally, y'all finally got your opportunities. Oh man. Like everything that Keith Lee's gone through with like, like, uh, like almost dying from having COVID and everything like that, coming from where he came from, me, misunderstandings, oh, let go out of this, oh, miss, all this stuff we went through. We finally climbed the mountaintop. There was so much ridicule and bullshit against us that, oh, we we don't deserve this. We, this should have went to these, this should have went to these opportunities. This opportunity should have went to these guys. No, I think these guys should have it. Everybody's saying it should go everywhere else, but I'm sorry, it's here. And I'm not going to apologize for that. I'm actually going to freaking gloat about that. And I'm going to raise my belts up high because I earned that. I work hard. Everybody works hard. But there's something special about Swerve and Lee that we actually have that. And we deserve that. And to answer your question about the future of those problems, in the grand scheme of things, that's kind of irrelevant. We've proven with problems we still win. And the fact of the matter is, as singles people, both of us have done history, historic things. I have done things no one else has done. So you put us together, you have a team that is almost untouchable. And I am confident enough to say that with everything that I fought through, with all the transgressions and the transitions and, and things that we've fought through together, I don't, when we say we're mountains in this tag team, maybe we're Mount Everest. It's hard to touch us. That's just being honest. Next que question for Tony. Um, given how how crazy it was for the acclaimed building, how much they were over tonight in a way that I think probably surprised most of us in this room, the level of it. When you were sitting back there, did you have give any consideration to calling it audible? Well, I think switching that's, the finish? I mean, that's, uh, look, it's up to, these guys are great wrestlers. Uh, why don't you come, why don't I address the match and everybody's got questions for Keith and Swerve. I think it's great to talk to the champions and then I'll talk about the match last. Thank you. Last, last question here for the champs, Nick. Um, well, I'll do a follow up on it and I'll address it to Keith and, and Swerve then. You know, there were my timeline was filled with people saying if there was a time to call an audible, this was the time. Oh, to, okay. There's a forget yeah. about that. I think in the context of the wrestling match, Nick, forget about audible. I mean, in the, you know, in the, in the flow of that was a classic wrestling match. And, and if I may, it, what's your question? Is my, it? Well, my question is how you two feel, how you two feel about reading, seeing people say that they thought that you guys should have maybe not won tonight. I could care less. Come get it from us. First of all, <laughs> let me be honest with you. Social media is very much beneath me. It is very rare that I read it. Okay. I got to tell him about the bullshit that he really does. He re he literally <laughs> reports to me and sends me links because I don't give a damn. Everything that I've done in this business, in this industry, just because we're in the ring and we make someone look incredible and we're good at it. We are very good at it. Stories are told, things happen. We pull something different out of everyone that we've ever fought. Now, I challenge you to, if this happens again with someone else, to have a better match than what we just put on out there. Accept the challenge and then show me. I need receipts. I'm just going to start asking for receipts from a lot of that. Until then, it sounds arrogant, but I'm being very honest. Mount Everest. Someone should climb it. Good luck. If I may, that was one of the best tag team matches we've had ever on AEW pay-per-view. The reaction to the crowd spoke to how great of a match it was and how excited they were to see it. 
Uh, just last night, actually, on the Elevation Special, there was a big milestone in AEW. The Acclaimed became the all-time leader in tag team wins in the history of AEW for their career as a tag team, the winningest tag team in AEW history. They're tremendous. Awesome. They put on a show tonight. That was a great match. I think we could all acknowledge that, and I think uh, you, you guys are all saying how great of a match tonight was. And I personally think that with Grand Slam coming up, AEW – Grand Slam at Arthur Ashe, Dynamite and Rampage, big special coming up September 21st. I think that uh, I can't imagine a better match for New York than hypothetically a rematch between Keith and Swerve versus the Acclaim. Okay, well, why, yo, why, yo, why, yo, why, why? I mean, come on. Why? It's a great match in their hometown. In their hometown. So, so the no. reality, reality is this. They did step up tonight. Okay. Okay. Why? Now, Why'd they step up, though? Why'd they step up? I am not going to. No, no, no. Flash no, no say it like for that. real. Like, say, why did they step up? You just said it. You just said it <laughs> with his answer. You just said that. There are times where beautiful magic is made. Now, are we part of that magic? We're the Absolutely. common denominator when it comes to magic in this. I don't know how much more we got to keep proving to everybody. Here's like, the thing. And why do they keep getting these, like, no. Here's no. my challenge to acclaimed. Okay. <laughs> They stepped up tonight. My challenge is when you, if this is the match, this is the match. Confirmed. Well, I'm just saying, I think it would be a great match. Are you and confirming you, people this? People are asking me. I mean, you know, you're asking me right now. I think it would be the best thing we could do at Grand Slam. I think they ask because yeah. they want to see. I think I, I think they asking, you No, want no, no, Tony, Tony, I'm sorry. I think they're asking because they, this is another fucking tag team that's coming up that says they want the belts on them rather than us. How many more times are we going to do that? You heard the reaction of the crowd. Y'all want y'all want them to win? I no, find they it not, interesting. They're not better than us. Sorry. So I, I will say this: it's interesting that in our losses we had to go down the ladder, but you want to do this rematch? But I'm not going to speak to that. I will admit I enjoyed the battle. They brought it. They stepped up. However, if they want to bring it properly, I would advise putting away the stereotypes. The silly raps, the jokes. Get Billy Gunn's ass the fuck out of there, too. Like that. Oh, my God. He was like a high school cheerleader out there. That was incredible in a sad way. But Well, I need to take some time and think about it, but I'm just saying I think it would be a great match for Grand Slam, and it would be great for the fans in I'll New I'd be York. glad to whip their ass again. I'm cool. Like, whatever. It's what it, it's what it is. Miss me with it all together, but. Tonight was, was, a, tonight was a milestone. Sold. Tonight was a great milestone in this company, one of the best matches uh, we've had. Yeah, by four African-American tag team, four people in that ring, too. So. With an African American tattoo. referee, boom, make more history that we're gonna keep doing. Realists, where are the realists? Listen, man, that's what you want to do. I'm just saying it's the world champions against the all-time wins leaders at coming off one of the best matches in the history of the company on biggest pay-per-view. I don't know. I just think it would be something special. Let I, I think it's tonight was a big night, but I'm just putting something out there. I think would be really great for Grand Slam. Guys. I mean, you you pay the bills, man. So you do what you gotta do. All right, well, I'll be there. If that's the way we go, uh, I think it sounds pretty good. All right. Don't be surprised. Somebody get hurt. <laughs> All right. We done? But don't put, we done I'm or we not done? a part of that statement. <laughs> Thank you very much, champs. Thank you very much. Thank, you, Thank you very much, sir. Appreciate you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Congrats, champs. Hey, it's great to see you. How are you? A wonderful champ. We should got Shivani up here. It's Tony, Tony, Tony. I'm just kidding. Yeah. Really is Tony get... time, isn't it? Yeah, it's officially Tony time. <laughs> Hi, Tony. Um, I'm Izzy from Hot Tag Fizzy. Congratulations. Thanks. Huge moment for you. Very awesome to see. Now, all eyes are on the AEW Women's Division right now, especially with an interim women's champion needed. So how are you planning to elevate the women's division even more with your new title ring? Man, um, I just want to say, uh, first of all, um, I... I can't believe how phenomenal this women's division is. I really can't. I've never seen such a group of determined women before. And uh, to be the champion, to be the leader of all of that, uh, despite the pressure, it's, it's just, it's it really is a huge honor for me. Um, I love this locker room. I fell in love with it on my first day. The moment I walked in, I was just like, wow, look at these women. I... I 
and now I'm the leader of it. So, um, yeah, I can't wait to I can't wait to get in there with every single one of them and uh, and and learn from all of them. And this is uh, by me doing everything I can to elevate these women. They're elevating me, and yeah, I'm really excited to get stuck here. My work's cut out for me. <laughs> Hi, Tony. Ricky Chino, SB Nation. Congratulations. Um, you know, we're kind of in a situation here now where, where we just saw John Moxley come off of a run where he was the interim AEW world champion, and he made his thoughts very well uh, clear what he thought of the I word. Um, how do you feel about that I word interim there? And uh, yeah. I mean, it's not ideal. Um, but uh, Thunder Rosa says she's injured. Okay. Um, so when she says she's not injured, she can come back and lose to me, and that'll be the end of that. I guess that's a that's a statement. That is a statement from the <laughs> champ right there. And yeah, that'll be that. <laughs> well, I have to say we've been coming off a great summer with an interim world champion, and you know I I know there's a lot of tough competition in that locker room for you, and every time you're in the ring, you give it a great fight. And that reminds me of the person who held the interim tag last time, because I have to say, you could not ask for a better professional wrestler, a more pro professional person or a better wrestler than the interim world champion AEW just had. And now the person holding the interim title, I can say all the same things about, I could not ask for a better professional to come into this company, to this locker room, to elevate this company and what a pro wrestler Tony Storm is and what a professional indeed you are and what an honor it is to work with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That means a lot. I'm really, um, yeah, I just want to say <clears throat> a huge thank you to Tony Khan and the, uh, the Khan family and all elite wrestling, because, uh, sorry to just lay this all on you guys. Um, in January, I had no job, no idea what I was going to do. Um, I walked away from what I, you know, everything I, I thought was normal in the world. And, uh, and Tony Khan jumped into my life and, uh, you know, gave me an opportunity uh, to enjoy what I love again and really find my passion again and uh, and a chance at survival, you know? <laughs> so, yeah, I just, I just, this is all just a bonus because I didn't even know I was going to have a job. So, thank you. We were in Chicago. We were in the city <laughs> and we were at the United Center and you had that amazing match and you came so close to winning the world championship at Forbidden Door. And I remember thanking you for the amazing match and telling you, you know, this isn't your last dance. There's going to be another time. And I didn't really know for sure that it was going to come so soon. Of course, nobody can be sure. And especially with four great wrestlers like there were in that great match tonight. But you are phenomenal, Tony Storm. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <laughs> hey, Dominic, D'Angelo, badfreeshows.com. Uh, Tony, uh, you had an interview with Renee Paquette a little bit ago, and you talked about kind of those uh, trials and tribulations of like leaving the other company and like kind of going into the unknown, almost kind of like just being frustrated with wrestling overall. Could you kind of elaborate a little bit more on really, and your husband too also talked like was a support system for you obviously too but i kind of want to get a little bit more info about how how you kind of got recharged batteries beforehand of going to aew and seeing like where you came from moving on from that and going into wrestling again yeah um <clears throat> no it's just it's been a crazy year i uh as i was saying before i i, I you know i had no idea what i was going to do I, I i found myself in a very strange predicament where you know, I just, uh, I had to take a leap of faith, uh, because I couldn't continue going on the way things were. So I just, I had to bet on myself and it paid off right here. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's been, <laughs> you know, I, I just, I found my passion again and I'm just really thankful for that. Yeah. I feel like I'm, I'm me again. Yeah. Last question from Dave. Uh, Dave Meltzer, Wrestling Observer. Uh, Tony, just do you have anyone specifically that you would like to wrestle as far as title defenses, um, or anyone, anyone that people are expecting, and even people that maybe they're not that you kind of look at? And you know, you've you've seen a lot of the Japanese women from working there for years and years. 
So is there any match like right now you're looking at and going like, this is a match that I really want to do? Oh, man. That's a tough one. Um, Because this locker room is uh, just unbelievable. But I think I'd like to meet Jamie Hayter again. Um, She's someone I've known a really long time, someone I've wrestled all over. And uh, I think uh, as it goes right now, she would definitely be my toughest competition. But I, you know, I also, I want to, I want to get in there with, with so many people. Um, Got Anna Jay, you know, I want to get in there with Anna Jay. I want to, oh, give me some names. Well, I mean, yeah, the, you know, Ty Conti, <laughs> Penelope Conti, Ford. Yeah. I want to, I just like, I really want to be able to get in there and, and, you know, meet everyone and, and, you know, get to know everyone. I'm really excited. Yeah, we have a great locker room, and there's a lot of great challengers. And uh, with a great champion like you, uh, the company right now has been really good box office time, and you've been coming into your own as the company's really coming into our hottest point in a long time. And uh, it's really in large part thanks to you. So it's really cool. No way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. For, well, yes way. Crazy. Well, thank you, Tony. Thank you. This is one more question. AJ, do you have one? Um, hi, Tony. My name is AJ from the AJ Awesome Show. My question is about Thunderstorm having to fight Thunder Rosa for the interim world championship, and you two have been a tag team. Um, is there anything you would like to say to Thunder Rosa about your tag team before you fight her? Oh, boy. Well, you know, it's kind of awkward because <clears throat> whilst this has all been going on, me and Thunder have formed, I guess, you know, kind of a friendship and we've we formed quite a nice team but I guess I want her to know that I'm not just going to sit in her corner and cheer for her you know and and be her little friend I'm you know I I came here to win championships I didn't come here to make friends you could say I mean I'll be cool and I'll be civil but I mean when she comes back I'm gonna whoop her ass Thank you, Tony. I think, uh, like you know, like these these gentlemen asked, until Thunder Rosa comes back, I think there'll be a lot of great challengers. We mentioned some great ones. I think, like you mentioned, Jamie Hader, I think would be tremendous. Uh, there's a lot of other ones. You mentioned Anna Jay. I think also Ty Conti, Penelope Ford, Red Velvet, Serena Deeb. So many great Serena wrestlers. Serena Deeb. The professor. Serena Deeb. That's another top wrestler. Okay, there you go. I. <laughs> That's who I was trying to think of. Serena Deeb. There you go. And I thought I thought you might have uh, been looking for that. And also, there's a lot of great wrestlers in addition to Serena and all the great wrestlers here that could come through the Forbidden Door. But maybe we hit on something there. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, thanks. Our friends coming? Great. Yeah, sure. I can tell him. Hey, John. No, I'm just going to get uh, Chris in here. Great. Chris, big star, big lean, you guys. I'm expecting back in black to hit over the loudspeakers and Chris Waltz is in. So. Uh, <laughs> license other music on that one. <laughs> um, on the media call the other day, you said if somebody asked you about something that you would go into things more in depth on it. And it was heavily insinuated throughout the call uh, based on media reports as well that there may have been potential contract tampering or allegations of such. Uh, Here's me asking about that further. Is there any comment that you would like to provide on that based on the media report? I'm not, I can't say what happened between anybody. I'm just, uh, you know, the, the, all that you may have heard, uh, 
you know, I can't really comment on it. I think uh, what the wrestlers and what the talent and the staff and the people here come and say to us Ooh. is between me and them. And now here is arguably the greatest pro wrestler of them all. Thank you, sir. Great. Hey, guys. How you doing? Nice. I feel like I'm in a zoo. You, Pittsburgh Penguins. Well, it's funny that it took 32 years for Brian Danielson and I to have a spotlight pay-per-view match. It's unbelievable when you think about it. I was thinking, when did this happen last? And it's when I had a match with Undertaker, the first match we ever had after I'd been in WWE for 10 years. And I was like, how did it fucking take so long for us to get... And, and we only had one match, never had a pay-per-view or anything. Uh, same with Brian tonight. It's just I really, really enjoyed this match because it reminded me of the matches I used to have with Eddie and Chris and Dean and all... The, Back in the day, you didn't call anything. You know, you just went out and wrestled. You just wrestled each other. And to do that tonight was so much fun because there's only a few guys you can do that with. You know, and Brian is one of them, obviously. So, you know, and, and Lionheart, I mean, it's 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 a it's a fun gimmick and it's but it's it's still me, right? And it's just using all of the stuff that I kind of forgot about. You know what I mean? And you know, it was just so much fun and just a, a fucking wrestling match. And I just liked that. You know, it really it was really, really a, a, a special one for me. Uh, Nick Hausman, Wrestling Inc. Um, there was, I asked Tony about this earlier this week, but there was the mandatory backstage talent meeting that Tony confirmed happened. Uh, reportedly, you spoke at that meeting, Chris. I was just wondering if you could tell us what you said to the roster and you know what kind of advice you're giving to talent and management right now at this period in AEW. You know, I mean the specifics don't need to be discussed even though you could read them online and that was one of the things that was discussed don't leak shit that's supposed to be private amongst us. But I think that I my message always is to remind people how special AEW is. And don't take that for granted. You know, like swearing and that sort of thing like all it takes is the wrong guy to see somebody say pussy or whatever the hell it is and they're gonna go done it happens we know this so just i always want to remind guys that please don't uh <laughs> ruin or potentially ruin this amazing world that we've created yeah. we don't want guys going into business for themselves we, we don't and we or can't, girls you know and, and where i came from working for vince for 20 years that was unacceptable it would never happen and I'm just trying to let people know that we're getting to the point now where these types of things are unacceptable as well. And we will start, you know, doing things that Tony would do if in the NFL or in, in with Fulham. And we are a pro sports multi-million dollar company with a huge television contract with another huge television contract coming up soon. So a lot of guys don't have that experience and don't realize just how special this is. So that's what I try and do whenever we have these types of meetings. And I have them, and Tony has them. We used to have them a lot more, but now it's a little more frequent. Just to remind guys, stay, stay, stay on course. Guys and girls, you know what I mean. Stephen Milhausen with the Zone, Chris. Great match tonight. And you were talking about, you know, Eddie and Dean and Chris Benoit. And where does Brian rank among those guys in terms of now? being in the ring with him well i mean i don't think there's such a thing as a bad brian danielson match um and i don't really rank guys against each other because everybody's unique either you're good or you're not and, and brian is beyond good obviously he's 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 one in a million and you know the moment he came into aw a year ago right i was like man one of these days we got to have a match but to me it's always the story that counts first you know you can put together a match but if there's not a proper story then what's the point? And we just started with G Jericho Appreciation Society and, and Blackpool Combat Club and Anarchy in the Arena. And that finish of Anarchy in the Arena of, of Jake and I choking Brian out was planting the seeds for a Jake and Brian match and for a Jericho Brian match. And that was three months ago or whatever it was. We knew we were going to do this at some point and get to it. And we did. And 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 the thing about it is that, like, I don't think it's it's one and done. There, there will be more. And the Danny Garcia thing just kind of once again organically happened and became this really cool twist to the story. And 
very intriguing. We don't know for sure what's going to happen with that. Um, you know, but we have to tune in on Wednesday to see the next step of it. So, um, yeah, it was just, it was, it, it, Brian's one of the best. He really is. I mean, and, and the fact that I got to actually experience that once again, the last time I, I felt this way is when I worked with Taker for the first time and just went like, where the fuck have you been all my life, man? Like, you know, I wish we had tours where we worked, we used to do 14 shows in a row. I could do that with Brian, you know, in many different ways. So it was just a, a real pleasure. Dave. Hey, Chris, how are you? Good to see you guys, man. Good to see you too. So when it comes to the mentality of reinvent, you know, you're reinventing yourself all the time because you have to do. You've been in the business for a long time and you have to keep things fresh. How, how did the Lionheart idea come in? I mean, in the it's, sense of, I mean, you did it before, but to go back to something that it's almost like you're going back 25 years in your career. Yeah. I mean, did it just pop into your head one day or well, was it well, something? So it's yeah. an interesting story. So we uh, built up a match with, with Jericho and Mox at Quake by the Lake for the title. Um, and prior to that, I was just finishing up with Eddie Kingston. And also Moxley was involved as well. But we did Anarchy in the Arena. And we did Blood and Guts. And then we did Barbed Wire Everywhere. And I remember Mox at one point going, well, we need some kind of a gimmick. Like, we, we've done too many gimmicks. Like, why don't we just have a fucking wrestling match? And he was, yeah, I like that. And then he texts me during the week. Mox is a man of few words, unless he's excited, in which case he'll talk your ear off. And he said, I got this idea. What do you think? I remember I was in London for my spoken word show. And he's like, I got this idea. Why don't I say, like, leave all the bullshit behind, leave the JS behind. I want the guy that I used to tape trade to see, that I watched in ECW in Japan, the Super Jacob, Lionheart, Chris Jericho. And at first I was like, well, that's interesting, because I'm not a guy who likes nostalgia. But I was like, that's really cool. It's almost like I just done the pain maker with barbed wire everywhere. Why can't we do Lionheart? That's actually really, really cool. And Tony loved it as well. So then I had the vest and then I went, I have a storage unit where I look through boxes of stuff and I found the kick pads, those original kick pads. But I could not find the tights, but I thought if kiss was going to go on tour and wear their costumes from 1977, they wouldn't wear the exact costumes. They get new ones made. So that's what we did. We got new ones made. We found the, the white zombie song, Electric Head, which was my ECW theme. And it all kind of just fell together. And the first one was such a huge success. And that's when, because I was like, this is great. But this is, I'll probably not do it again, but Tony loved it. I love it. And he's now, we're building a whole story around it. I love it. And it's it, once again, it fits in with the heel Jericho, almost delusion. I'm better than, I found the fountain of youth. I'm better than ever. I have the best wrestler in the world. Like I can say that stuff as a heel because it's so funny. When I lose a match, it's a great match. When I win, oh, 51 year old Jericho's burying the young guys. <laughs> you know, so like, and so I can kind of use that. I'm better. I found the foundation. Of course, I beat Brian Dennis. I'm the best wrestler in the world. So there's, there's that intrigues me as well because it's that little kernel of truth that I always like as a heel that you can just overblow to where people are like, shut the fuck up already, man. You know, like I really am having, we talked about this, maybe the best year of my career ever as far as star ratings and just great matches. And like you pointed out in different styles of matches too. So let's use that to our advantage. That be hiding behind it. Like it's pretty fucking cool. It's been a great year. So let's continue that. It's great. And, and also to just to add a little bit more color to it. So I loved it. When I heard about it, when uh, Chris and John, when I talked to them both, I loved it. I thought it was amazing. And then coming out of it, it was so special. Uh, the Quake by the Lake was a huge success, and the company's really heated up since then. You know, we were talking box office, and I'm sure I'll talk numbers and stuff when Chris isn't here, but Chris is a big numbers guy. And the company is doing, you know, some, some of our best numbers. We've had this incredibly hot run with Chris and John here, and now – we're as hot as we've been, you know, with the consistency we had through the summer with with Chris Jericho and John Moxley as fe top featured guys on television. I think of them as almost like the Sting and Ric Flair of this company, mm -hmm. guys that have been there from the beginning that I can always count on and that will be associated forever with as the first two champions of the company. And then the way the stability they brought through the summer, but then to tip it off and have such exciting things, Quake by the Lake, the great championship match, Punk comes back and have all the exciting stuff. The place is going wild, but then – uh, something we've been excited about for doing so long. 
Danielson versus Jericho and the Lionheart thing. The day after Quake by the Lake, they showed that side by side. Did everybody see the side by side of Jericho in '96 and in 2022? I mentioned this to Dave last night, uh, but for everybody, I was there in 1996 when that photo was taken. And I was, <laughs> how old are you? So I was just a year older than you. I was 13 years old. And my dad took me to the ECW arena. I was actually here in the state of Illinois. I got into the University of Illinois Laboratory High School. They tricked me because they said, if you take the exam, you don't have to go. You just have to prove that you can do it. So a bunch of my friends from school were actually here. People I grew up with were at the show tonight with my dad. And they, they tricked me because then I, I passed the exam. I got the 99.9 percent on this exam. And it's like, well, now you're going, you have to. And I was like, what? That's a bait and switch. If I've ever seen one, I was like, oh, well, you can do anything. You can do anything. About it. So I was a little, a little, I was your age and I got to go and see him. Do you know what they chanted when Chris left? At, they chanted, you sold out. And Chris was the biggest young baby face wrestler in the world, in my opinion, was the best young professional wrestler on the planet. And I was holding a sign that literally said, Chris Jericho is the best wrestler in the world. <laughs> and I had another, I had another sign. You know what it said? Shane Hart's Sean. Uh, but that's another story. <laughs> and uh, and uh, <laughs> Shane it's, Hart's Sean. It's, it's funny though, like it, the match, the, my final match at DC Arena was against Too Cool Scorpio. And the finish was a shooting star press. And he came down and, and he was so agile. He's a big guy, probably 240. And he came down with his elbow right on my eye. I remember I had a giant black eye. When that finish happens, if you pause it, you can see a young Tony Khan in the crowd with his dad, Shad. Can you imagine Shad Khan? This fucking brilliant billionaire walking into the ECW arena in 96. Probably thinking, what have I gotten myself into? He's a man of his word is what he is. He's a man of his word. And then this was the intermission. We went to intermission and uh, I went up to people in the front row and I was near tears. And I was like, and you know, there's like a lot of English football fans. That this is a great example of. And I think there's people in England who are fans of the NFL. This is a great example of sometimes you're a fan of a team and it's like your heart and soul and you breathe it and sleep it. But you've never even been to one of the games before. There's like people here who feel like that about there's Fulham fans or fans of a lot of the English teams and vice versa. There's people in England who've never been to an NFL game in America before, although they might come to some in in london but uh so it was my first time in the ecw arena but i felt like i'd been there a hundred times because i watched it and i walked up mm -hmm. to people and i go uh, they were like what are you so sad about and i go it's jericho we got the best wrestler <laughs> in the world here and they chanted you sold out of him and he's going to wcw let me ask you who would ever want to come wrestle in front of us now and i was like us oh, like i'd been there a hundred times and and but but that photo was taken chris looked as good as he ever has and honestly a lot of the guys when they saw that photo they all said the same thing i think chris looks better now mm -hmm. which is crazy to think and he's as good as he's been like he said i mean you look at the numbers don't lie again like this is as good a year as you ever have had according to according to dave at least and uh and i i think you know uh mox was right when you came out of the ring mox said that's he's wrestled you a lot of times but he thought you're better than you've ever been that was the best match yeah, was he's ever game. seen you have and tonight it was incredible lionheart's taking it to another level and I, it's only the beginning so i'm really excited I, Abe Cannon, Rock 95.5. Have you guys considered doing a Fozzie show after a live Rampage? When you do a live Rampage show? Because those are short shows. We used to do that early on in Fozzie, but it's hard. It's it's hard to do. You know, you can't do both at the same time. I, mean, I could do both. Like when we tour, we tour five days on and Tuesdays and Wednesdays are off to do Dynamite. And sometimes I'll miss a Dynamite when we're on tour. But doing the show, uh, the, the Fozzie show after uh, a rest AEW show would be very hard for me. Because it's two separate mentalities you know what i mean so i can't even imagine trying to do that yeah that would be yeah yeah it'd be very hard chris and denise salcedo from instinct culture so i wanted to ask you given your history with mjf what did you think of his return tonight i loved it i was not expecting like i i, I knew he was here but I was not expecting what uh, what I saw, and I thought that's really really cool. Now, the thing is, I worked with MJF for a year, and I know how creative he is and how good he is, so it doesn't surprise me. What surprised me the most is that we got "Sympathy for the Devil" by the Rolling Stones, and I'm like, okay, that's some money for sure. White Zombie, Electric Head, that's a certain level. You'd be surprised. I would be surprised. <laughs> yeah. I, I know that we asked for Van Halen uh at one point and they wanted like a million or some ridiculous thing and acdc wouldn't even call us back so the stones are much uh cooler and and uh, cheaper apparently um or maybe not that cheap but either way I just well they played our stadium former tia bank right, we had a great right, time that's right. so I, I thought it was it, it doesn't surprise me at all even though i was pleasantly surprised at, at how he did it yeah i'm a big fan of, of mjf i really am and I said to him, when you come back, you're going to be a baby face. And he's like, I don't want to be a baby face. I don't want to be a baby face. I said, it's, it's going to happen. 
He's like, I don't know what to do. I said, I'm sure The Rock said the same thing or Steve Austin said the same thing. You can do a babyface comeback. I'll teach you. It's easy. Getting, uh, it's easy. It's easier to make people hate you than it is to make them like you. But once they start hating you, that's when they really start liking you. And he's almost at that point. That's my prediction. I think he'll be one of our top baby faces, whether he wants to be or not, very, very soon. A game changer. That's my opinion. Thank you, guys. Thank Appreciate you, Chris. It. Thanks Thank so you. much, man. Thanks, buddy. Thanks, brother. Thanks, brother. Hey, uh, I'll, be, uh, I'll meet you, my Thanks, guys. How's it going, Tony? Good, man. Uh, so at one point in the night, um, this wasn't really seen to the fans on TV, but in the arena, uh, we saw after the six-man tag between the House of Black and uh, Darby Sting and Miro, we saw at the top of the stage the House of Black uh, hug, and then um, we saw Malachi kind of take a bit of a bow and blow a kiss to the fans. Um, is there anything we should all know about what's going on there, or um, was there any symbolism that that had anything to do with? No, I'm not sure. I can't comment on that, though, but uh, that, that was uh, for the live fans, and it definitely got some people talking, so it is a thing that happened, but no, we can't comment on that. Thanks, buddy. Thanks. Uh, I wanted to ask about a kind of a follow-up uh, sure, about your comments about alluding to contract tampering. You, you were also asked about a potential WWE AEW super show, and you said, not after the way they treated me. What happened when you when you say something like that? How were you treated? What what was the exchange there with WWE? I've had a number of interactions with them, and I don't know. I just, I, I'm not, you know, I, I was super... I, I've said a lot of nice stuff, and and I don't regret saying nice stuff because I'm super honest about pro wrestling. And when I saw good stuff happening there, I'll be the first to say it. But yeah, I just am not feeling the same love. <laughs> I, I don't want to get into it, but uh, you know, uh, I just haven't felt the same uh, reciprocation that I have uh, for them. Hi, Tony. Um, hey. Izzy from the Hot Tag of Izzy. Congratulations on such a huge night. Thank you. <laughs> now, leading up to AEW All Out, there was unfortunately some reports surrounding that the AEW locker room and talent were facing some adversity. Now, in, com <laughs> now, in comparison to sports team, whenever a team faces some sort of adversity, a game win usually pushes them over that threshold of challenges that they were facing. So with the overall success of All Out tonight, do you think that this is going to help the AEW locker room overcome those reported roadblocks. Well, I think there's still like a lot of wrestlers in professional wrestling who don't get along. And now it's more apparent than ever that there are those things. But I also think that the industry has thrived on creative tension for a long time. And then you might say, well, what if it doesn't manifest itself in a match right away? And I also think that, it, you know, as I mentioned other times this weekend, when in the 90s, which is arguably the all-time business peak and, and interest peak and really, I think, just the general peak of pro wrestling in many ways, the late 90s and early 2000s. Like, uh, you know, there was certainly a big, big group of pro wrestlers uh, who did not like each other. There were a lot of people who didn't get along, and a lot of times they weren't even in the same companies and they would rip each other. <laughs> and there was it was certainly not going to produce a match. But that is what we produce is wrestling matches, and there are a lot of matches uh, between people who probably don't get along and don't like each other. And it's not always an easy road to get people in the ring. But when you can get people in the ring to settle their differences in the ring, it can be really exciting. Um, there's a lot of conversation about people not getting along, not liking each other. I definitely, definitely uh, think that it's probably more apparent than ever that there's a lot of that. Uh, I don't like... And I don't like everything either. You know, people... I don't like everything people say. And uh, there's people that have uh, said things uh pretty blatantly even people that like work here that have just gone out and slammed me blatantly in public and there's only so much of it i'll take i'm a pretty nice guy and i'm very flexible um you know it's nice being home uh as, as a segue i uh you know being here seeing a lot of my friends i have a pretty calm demeanor generally with people and i'm willing to put up with a lot of abuse something that came up while i was doing an interview this week was one of the guys uh, that interviewed me while I was in town. He went to the University of Illinois and we kind of put together that I had bartended for him many, many times and served him many drinks over the years when I was a bartender in college. 
I have uh, that. I have a demeanor of uh, service. I try to service people, and that includes the wrestling fans. I will go around and ask if I can help somebody. I will gladly uh, offer somebody a hand or pour somebody a drink or whatever I need to do to make somebody feel better. But there's only so much slamming me and uh, knocking me I can put up with. But on the other hand, I will do like what's right for business when I have to. And so I think, you know, to be honest, um, when people don't get along, people don't like each other. I think I've been probably had people saying about as much stuff about me over the last few months as anybody. And sometimes you just have to take it and move on with business. And that's a part of it. Thank you. Hi, Tony. Hey, man. Brandon Thurston. From yes, Economics. I am. Well aware, sir. <laughs> sorry, but, but for the, yes, yes, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to uh, step on you. It's good to see you. Good to see you. Uh, can you tell us how this pay-per-view is selling? Uh, usually you get digital right away. Yeah, digital. Uh, so I'm, I, I am going to say I don't have an exact number for you. I think it's, it's probably, there's a chance it's going to be the second highest all-out ever. It may not be the highest all-out. It might be the first time we haven't hit that high. I knew last year the all-time high would be challenging. There's a big difference between this year and last year. We were the first professional wrestling show and the only professional wrestling show on Labor Day weekend last year. And we were the third professional wrestling show of the weekend this year. I don't think that's a coincidence. Uh, and when I talk about things I wasn't thrilled about, um, I was a little surprised we were the third professional wrestling show this weekend. And it's probably a little bit more challenging in the marketplace um, when it becomes a little more crowded. So our performance, given you know the prior years, we never had this kind of competition and it's kind of a first for us in AEW to see this kind of crowd marketplace. I'm not sure if this is what we'll see from now on. If it is, when the fight is brought, I will continue uh, bringing up fights of my own and I have unique ways to do that and a lot of money to fight with. And uh, this is not a game to me. This is uh, my life and I don't think it's a joke uh, and I take it really seriously. And yeah, so I am very happy with the numbers we did. Given the competition we had, I was hoping that it would be the all-time high for All Out, but it, I'm not sure it's going to quite hit that. So it's the first time an AEW pay-per-view in history did not top the number before, probably. But that being said, it's still going to be, uh, again, the second highest number we've ever done for All Out. And this year will end up being the biggest year on pay-per-view in AEW's history by far for pay-per-view revenue. It won't even be close. So uh, even with full gear to come, I'm quite confident this will be our all-time high for pay-per-view revenue. It's pretty similar to the other pay-per-views this year. I think it'll be Forbidden Door was an unprecedented success in the biggest debut in AEW pay-per-view history. Uh, a lot of the buys were international, and the price point is obviously a little bit lower on international. I think this would be more total buys and a higher domestic percentage, so the revenue would be significantly higher than Forbidden Door. I'd expect it to be similar to Double or Nothing, um, but All Out last year was higher than Double or Nothing was last year. Double or Nothing this year was a high all-time for Double or Nothing, obviously. I don't know if we'll quite hit that, but I do think uh, it's going to be uh, in that range. So uh, very good, given the competition that we've never faced before. This is kind of an unprecedented marker, in my opinion, but it's still the, the number is the number, and I have to face the competition out there. But when I compared myself to Jim Crockett Promotions this weekend, I think I got a taste of the same medicine Jim Crockett Promotions took. But I have a lot more fucking money than Jim Crockett did, and I'm not going to get – I'm serious. I'm not going to sit back and take this fucking shit. Tony, thank you for the time and a great show today. Thank you. And, you know, you look at, you see your biggest, without a doubt, your biggest star, your biggest mainstream attraction, and he goes off the rails a little bit towards your EVPs, another one of your big, one of your big young stars. And you as the leader of the ship, how do you try the best to fuse the entire situation? That is a dicey situation and it is uh, contentious and uh frankly challenging but i have to do what's best for the sake of the company and everybody you're talking about are great professional wrestlers with big reputations people that uh and some of them have been around from the beginning of the company some of them have been around uh just for about a year now but the fact is these are people that drive revenue and they help create jobs for everyone so i'm not gonna uh a, you know comment on uh, what you may have heard here but the fact is like i said earlier this week it's no secret a lot of professional wrestlers don't like each other, but I think now it's probably more out in the open than it's been in a while. I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing for the pro wrestling business, given what the product that we produce is and it's wrestling matches and it involves tension and people wanting to fight. 
and people know there's a lot of people that want to fight each other around here now and and i don't think that's terrible hey I would just like to dive a little deeper on into specifically the elite and the contributions that they've had to your company as EVPs and helping you get the company off the ground there. And as you've brought in different attractions throughout, roles have shifted in, in some degree one way or another. Where do they currently stand within your regime here in AEW? Have their roles changed in any capacity as some of these things have unfolded? Uh, no, I think those guys have been key people in in the planning and the organization of the shows and and involved in the business from day one and i think the business has grown and i've had to take on more but i think those guys have taken on strong roles and you saw tonight what an amazing match they put together on screen and they have huge behind the scenes contributions in in terms of the business and um different aspects whether it's kenny and video gaming and and you know important revenue streams that we're driving and the young bucks and, and many things mentoring and uh the leadership they provide and you know it was a big milestone tonight i don't want to take it lightly like it's very cool to me that kenny omega is the first triple crown champion in aw history i think it's really cool to have somebody who's been the world champion a tag team champion and now the first trios champion and it's a very cool way for kenny to come back and i think kenny omega and the young bucks is one of the best acts in professional wrestling and behind the scenes incredibly valuable people too aj did you aj do you have anything for me did you i just want to let me i want to make sure you're up you stayed late and you seem like you wanted to say something that's it aj's awesome and i want to make sure he gets it oh thank you leva um, I'm going to repeat it if the mic didn't hear it. Sure. Thanks. First off, great show tonight. And, um, another thing that people didn't see tonight on TV was the debut of Larry running out into the arena before the show. What was the reaction from you and backstage to Larry running out on stage? Well, Larry, uh, is a live wire and that was a live moment for the live crowd if there ever was one uh, i'm glad he didn't run out when there was wrestling going out there and uh but luckily cm punk got control of the situation and wrangled him in there pretty quick but larry uh got a taste of the live crowd you know i i don't know larry likes i think larry's like a sheep herding dog is what phil said he likes to like herd people and keep them so to see that many people he must have been like oh man that's a lot of people he likes a lot of people in one place so uh i thought um he had a good time it seemed like he had a good time at the show tonight was he, when he arrived, he was in good spirits, Larry. Um, thanks, everybody. Hey, great time. Thanks, everyone, for coming. I always really appreciate it. And uh, thanks. And hopefully I'll get to see some of you soon uh, at our next Scrum. Thanks, everyone.